Welcome everyone to our first panel of the day. We're very excited to be sharing the uh, wonderful speeches that we have planned with you all today. I am Bradley Jackson. I'm the Vice President of Policy here at ACTA. And I'd like to just say a few words about the theme of this year's conference, which is Dare to be Wise, Enlightenment, and the American College Campus. Now this phrase, dare to be wise, has, as so many things that act to do, a Latin derivation. Sapere aude, dare to be wise or dare to know. Sapere aude first comes to us through Horace's second epistle, published in 20 BC, where he wrote, if you don't call for a book and a light before daybreak, if you don't devote your mind to honorable studies, and pursuits. Envy and passion will keep you awake in torment. Well begun is half done. Dare to be wise. Begin. Here Horace was telling his correspondent that it is no, never too late to begin to be wise, to take seriously your role as a human being in this world to understand the world that you live in. And so it's no surprise that later in the historical period that we refer to as the Enlightenment, near the end of that period, in fact, the philosopher Immanuel Kant chose sapere aude, dare to be wise, as the, quote, motto for the Enlightenment in his famous work, An Answer to the Question, What is the Enlightenment, from 1784. Kant translated it in German, but uh, to translate into English, have courage to use your own understanding. This is what the Enlightenment means, to have the courage to use your own understanding to discover and understand the world. But why do we care about that today, and why is ACTA talking about it? Well, it's because the university system, the modern university system, is and should be dedicated to leading students to enlightenment and to the faculty leading society at large to enlightenment. And we are, in so many ways, the children of this historical period that we're studying, the enlightenment. We have enlightenment science, because folks like Descartes and Leibniz and Newton invented analytic geometry, calculus, and modern physics. We have enlightenment politics and economics, because of folks like Locke and Montesquieu, David Hume, Adam Smith, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, giving us ideas like liberal democracy, rule of law, separation of powers, market economics, and others. And more than this, and overall, we have an enlightenment culture. Particularly, US campuses are supposed to be dedicated to this culture of rationalism, open-mindedness, skeptical, empirical, and critical inquiry, and yes, even to the notion that we progress and grow through time. Concepts like free speech, academic freedom, and the overarching importance of discourse and debate are Enlightenment principles. But the Enlightenment also puts a lot on us. It's full of difficulty and contestation, and this is because it leaves us free to use our own minds and to work with others to find the truth. And so this Enlightenment culture is hard, I'd like to close my opening remarks by just quoting from the preliminary discourse to the Encyclopedia, one of the prime documents of the French Enlightenment. This discourse is written by Jean Laurent d'Alembert. And in it, he writes, it is true that our century, which believes itself called upon to change every type of law and to render equitable judgments, does not think very well of these men who were formerly so celebrated. Belittling them is nowadays considered the proper thing to do. Indeed, many men pride themselves on it. We seem to be trying with our contempt to punish these scholars for their excessive self-esteem or for the unenlightened approbation of their contemporaries. And in trampling these idols underfoot, it appears we would wish to cause their very names to be forgotten. But any excess is unjust. So the issues that we see on college campus today have been with us since the Enlightenment. They are part of the Enlightenment, and we must understand them from the perspective of the Enlightenment. And today we are very fortunate to have three wonderful scholars to help us do so. Alan Charles Kors, our honoree tonight, specializes in European intellectual history of the 17th and 18th centuries, 
with a general interest in the intellectual transformation of European thought and the relationships between orthodox and heterodox thought in France after 1650. He has written extensively regarding early modern French intellectual history, and he was the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of the Enlightenment. Dr. Kaur served on the National Council for the Humanities, was a Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholar, and has won both the Lindbach Award and the Ira Abrams Memorial Award for Distinguished College Teaching, as well as several national awards for the defense of academic freedom. In 2005, at the White House just down the street, he received the National Humanities Medal. His two latest works are Naturalism and Disbelief in France, 1650 to 1729, and Epicureans and Atheists in France, 1650 to 1729, both on Cambridge University Press and completing a trilogy on the diverse origins of atheism in early modern France. Our second panelist will be Peter McNamara. Dr. Mar McNamara is an expert in American political thought, the American founding, Alexander Hamilton, political economy, and early modern political thought generally. He is the author of Political Economy and Statesmanship, Smith, Hamilton, and the Founding of the Commercial Republic, and the editor with, of The Noblest Minds, Fame, Honor, and the American Founding, as well as with Lewis Hunt of Michigan State University, Liberalism, Conservatism, and Hayek's Idea of Spontaneous Order. Professor McNamara has taught at Utah State University, Boston College, and Clemson University, where he was Hayek Visiting Scholar, and he is currently at the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. And then last but not least, Dr. Thomas Merrill is an associate professor in the School of Public Affairs at American University. He is the author of Hume and the Politics of the Enlightenment on Cambridge Press, which won the Del Delbo Winthrop Prize for Best Recent Work in Political Philosophy. He's also the co-editor of The Political Thought of the Civil War, among other volumes. Dr. Merrill has held fellowships from Harvard, Princeton, and the American Enterprise Institute, and was a senior research analyst for the President's Council on Bioethics during the George W. Bush administration. He's associate director of the Political Theory Institute at American University, and he has also served as the coordinator of the undergraduate program of the Department of Government, as well as the chair of that fine department where I also happen to teach. So please welcome our first panelist, Dr. Alan Charles Gore. The French philosophes, uh, it's the French word for philosopher, but adopted by thinkers of the French Enlightenment. Uh, the French philosophes faced a culture in which the abuse of power of some over others, religiously, politically, socially, was part of the presumptive authority of the past against which they struggled. Uh, one of the hardest things to communicate to students teaching the Enlightenment is the difference between a rejection of authority and a rejection against the presumptive authority of the past. Uh, and it's led to many a misunderstanding of, of Enlightenment views. They certainly believe in authority. Uh, that needs criteria to establish, for example, intellectual authority. But the mere fact of survival in a society does not give that presumptive authority any special meaning, its presence any special uh, meaning. The uh, Enlightenment rejects all notions that whatever is should be continued in society. Uh, it's the mark of a traditionalist society to fear that things will get worse if you change. One of the remarkable aspects of the late 17th and then the 18th century in Europe and particularly in France and in England uh, is the emergence of a view that things can get better. Uh, and when things can get better, then models of authority stand in need of justification. By the early decades of the 18th century, the French philosophes look longingly to Britain for models of a freer, more innovative, and more decent society. This was true not only of the celebrated Montesquieu's account of balances and separations of power, 
but of the work of the most influential of all French thinkers, Voltaire, who in his Letters from England, his Lettres Philosophiques, presented religious toleration and voluntary exchange as mutually reinforcing goods that brought prosperity and peace to Britain. His glowing description of the royal exchange in London was a celebration of individual freedom and voluntary commerce and exchange. At the end of his letter on the Presbyterians, uh, in which he has dealt with the English Civil War, religious fratricide, the hatred of the clergy in 17th and early 18th century Britain for each other, he presents us the stock exchange, quote, you will see representatives of all the people gathered there for the benefit of humanity. There, the Jew, the Muslim, and the Christian deal with each other as if they shared the same religion, and they reserve the name infidel only for those who go bankrupt. <laughs> There, the Presbyterian trusts the Anabaptist, the Mennonite, and the Anglican accepts the promise of the Quaker, end quote. The exchange was a scene of, quote, peaceful and free assemblies, after which individuals made voluntary choices about their private religious lives. Voltaire drew the following conclusion. If there were only one religion in England, there would be danger of despotism. If there were two religions, they would cut each other's throats. But there are 30 religions, and they live together in peace and happiness." End quote. What was English for Voltaire was the religious toleration so essential to the needs of a commercial Britain emerging from generations of political instability and religious hatreds and anathematizations. England had recognized that peace and mutual forbearance were immeasurably superior to the creedal fratricide of prior centuries. Using England as a foil to criticize France Voltaire presented a vision of a society in which laws rather than men's wills rule. Civil liberties are every citizen's right, regardless of birth or rank. Religious tolerance ends the fanatical civil strife of persecuting churches and sects. A society in which commercial prosperity allows the individual to serve his own interest while enriching the society at large, and in which the arts and sciences, freed from restraint, are given the freedom to flourish. He stressed the constitutional nature of the British monarchy, the liberty that flows from a government of law, not whim, equality of taxation, the comfortable lot of the English yeoman compared to the French peasant burdened by almost all taxation, under liberty and law in the greatness, prosperity, and peacefulness of a tolerant England engaged in productive commerce. These are all themes that Montesquieu had engaged in the 1720s in his Persian letters. He has an epistolary novel of Persian visitors to France, commenting on life in France, in Europe, and the difference between the two cultures. Montesquieu often compared, via these letters, the Persians favorably to the French, but not in their treatment of women, which became a metaphor for despotism. Here is the voice of despotism in its purity as Montesquieu's Persian traveler, Uzbek, wholly blind to his own despotism, so sensitive to every abuse of power in Europe, writing to his chief eunuch about his harem and slaves. Quote, 
and what are you but mere tools which I can break at will, who exist only in so far as you can obey, who are in the world only to live under my laws or to die as soon as I command it, and who finally can have no other destiny but submission. For Montesquieu, it was part of human nature to be aware of all abuses of power but one's own, which is why, of course, one chooses to limit power itself. Despotism was always the enemy. Enlightened despotism would have been an oxymoron for French Enlightenment thinkers. Diderot's patroness, Catherine II, asked for his formal responses to her proposals for reform of Russia. Diderot was frank, quote, there can be no true civilization, laws, population, agriculture, trade, wealth, science, taste, or art where liberty does not exist. Her refusal to address serfdom, he said, was, quote, an acceptance of slavery. The only equality worthy of the name, he lectured her, was when, quote, citizens unequal in power, strength, and every kind of means should all be equal before the law. The past had been phantasmagoric when Enlightenment thinkers looked back over recent centuries in Europe. And the focus upon what institutions to preserve was under debate in a way that Voltaire found inappropriate, namely judging by original intention. And for Voltaire, it was crucial for folks to understand that even if the genesis of what is good was not itself always admirable, one judges by the effect of things upon human life and well-being. Historical consequences, even if wholly unintended, can matter much, much more than intentions. In his campaign on behalf of inoculation against smallpox, Voltaire confessed that the practice arose in Turkey because Circassian families wished to sell their daughters more expensively into the sex trade. But the origin was irrelevant to the evaluation of a beneficent innovation looking at the English death tables since inoculation was introduced. Similarly for Voltaire, English liberties had not arisen from a desire for liberty. Magna Carta was not designed to achieve limited government, but as a way for the barons to limit the power of the king over themselves. English liberty arose without long-term intention from efforts to, excuse me, from efforts to prevent particular abuses. Creating protections against the abuse of power, it turned out, paid modal benefits across the generations. Think on that every time you hear slave owners wrote the Bill of Rights coming from a college professor. The human mind, as Hayek famously put it two centuries later, cannot foresee its own progress, but civilizations and nations evolve, learn, and achieve what they never could plan. For Voltaire, a backward China now had been a great civilization while the West had lived in barbarism. What had made European progress possible, Enlightenment authors agreed, was nothing inherent but Europe's ability to learn to modify what it received from the past by wisdom in the present. The great question, I should start to conclude, the great question for Montesquieu was that of human variety and natural consequence. No human society could be permanent. Each generation and civilization 
face the three great problems of political life, can one avoid the catastrophe of despotism? Can one achieve rights while avoiding anarchy? Can one secure a separation, balance, and mutual check of those tendencies in human society, monarchical, aristocratic, democratic, that still leave room for liberty and self-governance. Tone mattered as much in argument in the French Enlightenment, often as content. Before the revolution, Voltaire had triumphed in so many ways. Torture had been abolished in France. Legal intolerance of French Protestants repealed right before the revolution. Sentences of victims of judicial murder acknowledged and overturned. How could one achieve that in one generation of writing? If you don't know Voltaire's tone, you don't know his influence. This is how he begins his treatise on tolerance. We quickly forget the multitude of dead who have perished in countless battles not only because death is the inevitable fate of war, but also because those who die by the sword could have inflicted death on their enemies, had the means of defending themselves. When risk and advantage are equal, death is no longer a shock, and even pity is lessened. But when an innocent father is delivered into the hands of error, passion, fanaticism, when the accused has no defense but his virtue, when those who make the decision can slaughter him without risking anything but making a mistake, when they can slay with impunity from an order from the bench, then the voice of the public is heard and each fears for himself. They see that no man's life is safe before a court that was set up to guard the life of citizens and all the voices join in a demand for vengeance. The unresolved tensions of the French Enlightenment indeed remain with us. What modality of power is permissible to achieve reforms? Replacing birth by merit and legal equality, how do we avoid egalitarian expectations of outcome? And can there be self-governance without a virtue? And if not, what are the durable sources of such virtue essential to self-governance? The French Enlightenment taught a civilization that mutual forbearance, commerce, peace, and prosperity go hand in hand. Lose the former, and all the rest is in peril. The foundation of liberty, its sine qua non, is resistance to all oppression of the human mind. The price of that, which we should welcome, is an endless series of debates. When Salman Rushdie emerged from his first year of hiding, from his sentence of death for offending the mullahs and Ayatollah Khomeini, he was asked what had he been doing for a year. He answered, reading a lot of Montesquieu reading a lot of Voltaire. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here uh, with Professor Kors. Um, uh, thank you to Active for the invitation. Um, my title um, uh, for this presentation is Adam Smith, Radical Scott. Uh, but before I get to Smith, I want to talk somewhat briefly, uh, well, maybe not so briefly, about the idea of enlightenment itself. Um, uh, as Brad reminded us, um, there have been many enlightenments, or at least a, a few very important ones. Uh, I think first of the Socratic enlightenment, uh, which gave rise to political philosophy uh, in the face of enormous hostility uh, there was also the medieval and Jewish enlightenment. 
uh, which confronted the challenge uh, to science and reason uh, by the biblical God, by the acknowledgement of a biblical God. Um, on any t set of terms, both these enlightenments would have to be described as radical, radical enlightenments. Um, this leads me to, uh, I think, the more controversial uh, uh, thing I'll say today, um, and that is that um, the modern enlightenment uh, is, from its beginning until the present day, a radical movement. Uh, much very interesting scholarship, uh, indeed profound scholarship, has been done, devoted uh, in recent decades to categorizing and expounding uh, the different national approaches to the Enlightenment, and more importantly, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, categorizing and delineating the different schools or strands of the modern Enlightenment. What has emerged is a division between what is described as a radical Enlightenment uh, versus a moderate Enlightenment. This research has been extremely rich and extremely helpful, but I think it overlooks or obscures one very important thing. Uh, and that is that from the beginning, the Enlightenment is a radical project. Um, its goal is radical. That leads me to wonder uh, whether it really makes sense or how important it is to describe a radical versus a moderate or pragmatic Enlightenment. Um, what does it matter? The, um, which, which means uh, do you choose to get to that radical goal? Is it moderation? It could be moderation, could be stealth, uh, could be revolution. What does it mean then to pursue a radical goal in a moderate way? Or is that even possible? Um, consider the scope of the modern enlightenment. Unlike the Socratic Enlightenment and the medieval Enlightenment, the modern Enlightenment aims at changing society, uh, really um, uh, as civilization as a whole. Uh, consider some of its key uh, uh, lines of attack or uh, elements, uh, a change in the nature of science, or on, on the understanding of science, uh, a change in the understanding of the status of the individual, uh, the role of government in our lives, the role of commerce, um, and uh, accompanying it, the status of comfortable well-being as a goal for humanity, uh, and lastly, the role of religion. Um, now, this list is something of a, a menu. You could have, uh, uh, you could place the emphasis on uh, changing the status of the individual. Uh, you could place the emphasis on spreading commerce. Uh, but the goal is um, uh, generally the same. Now, to drive home the point, uh, let me um, give, give you sort of one example. Uh, consider the First Amendment. Uh, and this is to, to, to point to the radicalness of the goal of the modern Enlightenment. Consider uh, the First Amendment. Uh, it protects our freedom of speech, religion, the press, assembly, petition, and so on. Now, what would Socrates have said about the First Amendment? Uh, he was convicted of religious crimes and corrupting the young, uh, but uh, he drank the hemlock, uh, and in his political discussions, never comes close to recommending anything like a First Amendment. Uh, the goal of our enlightenment uh, uh, is indeed radical. Now, uh, conservatives uh, these days are quite attached to the First Amendment uh, for obvious reasons uh, pointed out by um, uh, Michael Polyakov. Uh, but we should realize that that hasn't always been the case. Um, some of you might remember the great Walter Burns um, uh, of Cornell and Toronto and the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, his first book was The F First Amendment and the Future of American Democracy, uh, which among other things pointed to the problems he saw in the First Amendment uh, um, um, in supporting a democratic republic. 
So let me, with that by way of background, let me turn to Smith. Uh, Smith is usually seen as the embodiment of the moderate enlightenment. Uh, he was the author of the stately theory of moral sentiments. In his politics, he was a skeptical Whig uh, who rejected state of nature theorizing by the likes of Locke and Rousseau. Uh, on top of these foundational opinions of Smith, uh, there were also Smith's uh, sometimes infuriating caveats, uh, exceptions, qualifications to the arguments that he makes. Uh, but there are times when Smith does speak unequivocally. Uh, these statements are so, uh, to speak, uh, hiding in plain sight. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit from The Wealth of Nations in a moment. Uh, his statements on the power of commerce to transform society in a positive way, I believe, fall into this category. Uh, and let me just give you uh, one example. This is kind of a long passage from Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations, so I'm not going to read it all. Uh, this, uh, has to, this is from the section where he's dealing with the problem of religion. In the state in which things were through the greater part of Europe during the, during the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, and for some time bef both before and after that period, the constitution of the Church of Rome may be considered the most formidable combination that ever was formed against the authority and security of civil government, as well as against liberty and the happiness of mankind, which can flourish only where civil gov government is able to protect them. In that constitution, the grossest delusions of superstition were supported in such a manner by the private interests of so great a number of people as put them out of all danger from any assault of human reason. Because though reason might um, uh, perhaps have been able to unveil, even to the eyes of the common people, some of the delusions of superstition, it, never, um, it could never have dissolved the ties of private interest. Had the, this constitution been attacked by no uh, other enemies but the feeble efforts of human reason, it must have endured forever. Uh, but that immense and well-built fabric, it must have, uh, which uh, all wisdom and virtue of man could never have shaken, much less um, overturned, was by the natural course of things, by commerce, and is now likely, uh, in part destroyed, and is now likely uh, in the course of a few centuries, uh, more, more perhaps to crumble into ruins altogether. Smith's comments reflect his discover, discovery and exploration of uh, a power that uh, already exists in the world, but had largely gone unnoticed, except by Montesquieu uh, and Voltaire. Uh, Smith leads those out, those guys out. Um, namely the power of commerce. Uh, the power is stronger and more reliable than human reason. Furthermore, it is effectively promotes and in, um, uh, advances human reason and human liberty. Uh, this is a remarkable and indeed radical claim. And I believe qualifies Smith to be dubbed a radical Scot. Uh, there are other statements in The Wealth of Nations to do with um, the spreading of human liberty through commerce uh, and um, uh, also the balance of power between civilized societies and barbarian societies. Uh, I could, we could um, um, uh, talk about those because I think those also fall into this category of radical statements hiding in plain sight. Uh, but in the interest of uh, time, I think I'll stop there. Uh, and hand things over to Tom Merrill. I want to start by thanking ACTA um, for the work that it does. Um, I've come here almost, almost literally from the faculty senate of my institution. And I think it's clear today than it has been for a long time that higher education is badly in need of a reset of some kind. It's not clear to me how that's going to happen, but I feel that it is on the way or at least the need of us is um, very sharply felt. Sometimes organizations like ACTA can say some things more clearly and more forcefully than those of us who are working on the inside can. 
uh, and speaking as a person who's still trying to reform universities from the inside, um, I have to say thank you to ACTA for what you do, and also thank you to the many friends that, that, um, that I and my wife have here in the organization. Um, I also want to thank ACTA for the invitation to speak here, and uh, if you're disappointed that you're not seeing Gordon Wood right now, I share your disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I assume that uh, part of the reason, I thought that part of the reason that I was uh, asked to speak on this panel is something that Brad did not mention in his uh, introduction, which is that I'm one of the new co-editors of the journal American Political Thought, published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, with um, great help from our friends in the Jack Miller Center, some of whom I see here today. Um, as a new journal editor, uh, a person has great anxiety about having enough submissions to the journal. And so I find myself soliciting such submissions far and wide in graduate seminars, conferences, calling up friends, old friends who have graduate students, um, but also in places like barbershops, pharmacies, <laughs> Uber drivers, the neighborhood bar, and shame on me, Twitter. <laughs> um, and now I'm here with you. So um, it is a privilege to be here, and, I, and um, this is an audience uh, for which there may well be people in the audience who might have something that they would like to say in a journal called American Political Thought. And so um, if the only thing I can convey to you today is uh, I invite your submissions. So. Um, I've been asked to speak about Enlightenment, Education, and Liberty in the American Founding. Um, I want to say something about studying the founding today in our polarized political climate. And I also want to say something about the mission of the university. Uh, start with the obvious fact that the founders are still very much alive in our national consciousness, and indeed perhaps even play an outsized role in it. Some of this is healthy, healthy civic reverence, but a lot of it is something else. I think the founders for us serve as proxies, not to say sock puppets, for conflicts that are more about our unhappiness with the state of our country and with each other today than any disinterested study of the past for its own sake. Think here of the dueling 1619 and 1776 projects, which um, you may be glad to hear, I do not plan to rehearse here. Um, suffice it to say that it often feels as though the study of American political thought has become yet another venue for the endless culture war that seems to characterize our political situation. Our public conversation is dominated by those who think the founders are the fundamental source of, of all of our woes, let's call them the negators, and those who think there's nothing wrong with the country that more of the founding couldn't solve, let's call them the affirmers. These two perspectives line up in a fairly straightforward way with the familiar sides of our endless culture war which is to say that the past has started to look more and more like just another version of the present. The truth is, as often said, um, that the past really is a foreign country. They do things differently there. One benefit of studying the past, any past, is that we can learn just how different it was, and therefore maybe, just maybe, get some perspective on our own time. We can, for a time, get out of our own heads, think about someone else's problems, and maybe, question mark, gain some wisdom about our own. Today I want to try to get us out of our heads a little bit by talking about a figure we talk about a lot, um, and sometimes I think too much, Thomas Jefferson. It's not that I have anything new to say about Jefferson exactly. At this point in our history, who could say something new about Thomas Jefferson? Um, but I do want to suggest that we might look at him from a somewhat different angle than we normally do, one orthogonal, let us say, to our familiar political battle lines. And then I want to relate that to, to a point about the mission of universities today. I start with this observation about Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson was weirder and more complex than our political discourse today can easily acknowledge. Consider these two facts. On the one hand, Jefferson was, as our online students might say today, French Revolution adjacent. He was sympathetic to the revolution for a long time longer, perhaps, than uh, good judgment would have uh, indicated, certainly longer than we feel comfortable with. In a well-known letter to William Short in 1793, Jefferson praised or at least accepted the violence of the French Revolution as necessary for the cause of human freedom. On the other hand, at the end of his life, Jefferson was Southern secessionist adjacent. The whole point of the famous letter to John Holmes of 1820, sometimes called the wolf by the ear letter, is that if Congress tries to regulate slavery in the territories, the southern states will have cause to break with the Union. 
Contra to Abraham Lincoln's later appeals to a founding consensus on slavery in the territories, uh, when Lincoln's appeals were carefully crafted for his political audiences, Jefferson thought, at least at the end of his life, and argued that slavery should in fact spread throughout the territories. This Jefferson also makes us feel uncomfortable. But ask yourself, how do you describe a figure who wrote the Declaration of Independence, sympathized with radical parts of the French Enlightenment, and yet still ended up in a place close to what the South became? Not the same, but close. I don't think that we have a name for this in our, in our regular political categor categorizations. Jefferson remains frustratingly other to our familiar political categories. What are we to make of this? Perhaps this ob observation might help. For most of us, the first word that comes to mind when we hear Jefferson's name is the word hypocrite. And of course, it's hard to argue with that for all the reasons that you know. But I want to suggest to you today that the word hypocrite doesn't really do justice to the Jefferson phenomenon. For one thing, hypocrite leads us to think about this situation largely in terms of personal moral behavior, as though it were simply a matter of someone preaching one thing in public but acting differently in private. And of course, there is a dimension of Jefferson's uh, character that fits this, and one only has to think of the, the Sally Hemings story. But from the point of view of citizens, of people concerned with the health of a common civic project, that's not the only and probably not the most important way to see this. From the citizen's point of view, the question of what Jefferson did or did not do as a statesman has to be much more important. And here, a historian's point might help the conversation. When we think about Jefferson's hypocrisy on slavery, we tend to talk as though all of his actions and statements on this topic were contemporaneous. But of course, they weren't. Jefferson was in public life for a long time. And as a politician, he was often responding to changed circumstances with a changed political coalition that he was trying to manage. He's a political man. I'm not defending him at all in saying this, but context does matter. Historians usually distinguish three phases of Jefferson's uh, career and writings, public statements on slavery. First, there's an explicitly anti-slavery period from the early 1770s, say, roughly, up until Jefferson's return to uni the United States from France to take a role in the Washington administration in 1790. This is the period of the Declaration of Independence, the anti-slavery statements in the notes on the state of Virginia, and others. I suspect that if Jefferson had died in 1790, his reputation, and he was a hypocrite then, if he was ever a hypocrite, right? I think, think that's true. His reputation on the slavery issue would be con considerably higher than it is now. Starting around 1790, Jefferson goes silent about slavery, and this is the second big phase of his career. He seems to have realized that being outspoken on slavery would marginalize him with members of his own political coalition and defeating the political interests that he was trying to promote. His political coalition is um, a sort of a mix of anti-slavery, uh, not yet abolitionists, but people who are, believe in natural rights, and Southern agrarians. Those groups mix, but he's trying to keep that together. Of course, during the 1790s, we also know that Jefferson was engaged in a titanic battle with Hamilton and Hamilton's Federalists. He seems to have thought that while slavery was a long-term problem and a threat to the health of the country, the battle with Hamilton was far more urgent and was something that he could do something about in the short term. When he speaks about slavery in this period, mostly in private letters, he says that public opinion is not yet ready to move on the slavery issue, that progress of enlightenment on the issue will take a long time, but is coming, and that this will be the task of generations, not the task for a single statesman. This period goes on until about 1820, when Jefferson, moved by the Missouri crisis, speaks up to intervene in the controversy, most notably in the letter to John Holmes of 1820, the wolf by the ear letter that I just mentioned. That's really a crucial document, I think, for understanding Jefferson's final position on slavery. While Jefferson never gives up on his public identification with natural rights, he wants to have that as the, the, one of the things that's on his tombstone. Uh, and that position, I think, implies an anti-slavery stance. I don't see how it could not. I think it's fair to say that his policy positions, as you might say, were objectively pro-Southern. He now warns northern anti-slavery politicians that any direct action on slavery will be a cause for the southern states to leave the Union. He says that Congress has no constitutional power to regulate slavery in the territories. And he says, disturbingly to our ears, that slavery should spread throughout the territories, I think because he thinks it would be easier to end, at least that's what he says. All of this is pretty much the exact opposite 
of the restrictionist position that Abraham Lincoln would later attribute to the founding generation. We sometimes want to tell a story in which American history is a continuous story of progress, but that's not, not true in some important way. Something else becomes apparent around 1820 that's relevant to our consideration of Jefferson. It's clear that public sentiment in the southern states has shifted on the issue of slavery. Whatever theoretical objections they might have to slavery in the abstract, Southerners have come to think that they aren't going to end slavery anytime soon. They don't actually think that they're committing a moral crime in participating in the institution. One can detect in a number of texts from this time period, and some people who are quite close to Jefferson, the stirrings of the opinion that would become to known as the positive good theory of slavery. For my purposes here, the key point is that Jason, Jefferson's basic political coalition is at this moment in the, in the process of exploding. Jefferson had gambled in 1790, uh, around 1790, and this is simplifying a little bit, on a political coalition that united the natural rights doctrine and therefore anti-slavery doctrine with agrarian interests, the interests of, of agriculture as opposed to manufacturers. Call this the Virginia vision of what the founding meant. But as opinion in the South shifted over decades to a more, more positive view of slavery, that coalition was increasingly impossible. The Jefferson Party was the big winner of the battles of the 1790s and would go on to rule American politics for a quarter century thereafter. And if one wants to lodge a criticism, I'm not sure that criticism is the best way to see these things. If one wants to lodge a criticism against Jefferson, I think that's the time period that one should really think about. What was it that happened in the period of radio silence in which everything seems to have changed? But by the 1820s, the wheels were coming off that project. Nation, nascent abolitionism was, in a way, the source of the coalition exploding. But more importantly, it was precisely Jefferson's coalition, uh, the people who agreed with Jefferson's practical politics, meaning states' rights, um, local government, um, limiting the federal government, support for agriculture over manufacturers, were beginning to reject Jefferson's theoretical politics, that is, the doctrine of natural rights. I want to suggest to you that this practical contradiction in Jeffersonian politics, which clearly anticipates the catastrophe of the Civil War, was much more important for the course of American politics than his personal hypocrisy. Indeed, the word hypocrisy doesn't really do justice to the depth and consequence of the breakup, the fundamental tension within Jeffersonian politics, within the Jeffersonian political project. A better word, I think, would be tragedy. By tragedy, I mean grand self-contradiction not merely personal in inconsistency. According to the traditional understanding of tragedy, the tragic hero takes actions to become himself fully, but in so doing undermines himself and leads to the destruction of things that he holds dear. And that self-destruction is traditionally understood not merely as a private failure, but as a public failure, one having consequence for the whole community for the rest of us. And I do think in some ways we're still living with the consequence of the failure, and I'm not sure failure is the right word, but of the breakup of the Jeffersonian coalition. It's hard for me to believe that Jefferson could have intended or that he could have foreseen um, uh, the outcome, yet the sequence has a kind of logic and tracks certain contradictions in the Jeffersonian worldview. And this is maybe the, the most important question that I wrestle with. Why do we human beings act in ways that undermine what we profess to care about most deeply? Why is it so hard for us to be our best selves? Not to mention what we can never forget, the human suffering and trauma that inevitably accompanied the institution of slavery. Uh, and I just want to say that's, that we have to keep that front and center in our minds. There's some mystery here, some darkness in the human heart that I, for one, that do not completely understand. I want to come now back and in, in come to conclusion to where we are today and, and offer some reflections on our debates about the founding and about the mission of the university. It seems to me that both the negators and the affirmers get the founding wrong. The negators are blind to the fact that there is something noble and great in the American founding. And if we don't see that, we're, we're, we're missing the boat. We aren't wrong to continue to live with them, to allow them to question us, and for ourselves to, to question them. The affirmers, on the other hand, go wrong because they think that the legacy of the founding is a political cause, an ideology that has to be endorsed or attacked today. But a legacy or an inheritance isn't a political cause in that way. It's a fact. It's a given about us and our, and our political community. It's there whether we like it or not. And it continues to shape us both positively and negatively, whether we want it to or not. It's not a political platform, but a problem, a 
a predicament, and it needs to be understood and investigated before being affirmed or negated. There's an even deeper problem here, which confounds any simple affirmation or negation of the American founding. This is the obvious fact that the core of our tradition is, paradoxically, the critique of tradition. That is the spirit of critique, which is, to, and this is a very Jeffersonian point. American conservatives conserve a revolution, and even the idea of revolution. Conversely, it might be said that American progressives can only make progress by reenacting, and so, perhaps not fully knowingly or self-consciously, remembering and conserving the revolution that created the country. Progressives need the memory of the revolution as much as conservatives need the memory of the revolution. Today, our universities have no more pressing task than to create the institutional conditions for the non-institutionalized activity of critique, of something like the spirit of revolution, to create and steward spaces for the life of the mind. In this way, we try to keep something alive that is all too easily overwhelmed by political passions, the necessities of life, and the imperative to make a living. Whether we're succeeding in that mission, I leave to you. Uh, but I want to leave you with one last remark about Jefferson. In a letter to Samuel Kirchhoff in 1816, Jefferson proposed that a healthy country should have a constitutional convention every 19 or 20 years. As every new generation of citizens reach maturity, we can't even have a speaker. I'm not sure how we could have a constitutional convention. OK. Um, now, there are many practical objections to the scheme. For anyone who's worked in a complex organization with many competing points of view, the idea of putting all the rules up for discussion at a single time will induce seasickness. I can only say this as someone who works in the faculty senate. <laughs> and yet there's a deeper truth in Jefferson's suggestion. For what is he trying to say by saying this? Only this, we in later generations are not subordinate or inferior to the founders. We are not for Jefferson mere inheritors, grateful recipients of the excellence of others. We are moral and political equals to those who came before us. That is, he is, in this somewhat crazy proposal, simply restating the basic claim of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. I conclude, the Amer study of American political thought teaches us many things that we need to know. It acquaints us with landmarks we need to know to navigate our common life. But it also teaches us that the founding cannot provide us a recipe or a key to solve our problems today. It is neither the source of all of our woes, and nor can it be their remedy. Only we living today can do that. Whether we have it in us to actualize that potential remains to be seen. Thank you. We have uh, time for uh, questions now. There are some microphones circulating around the room. So uh, put your hand up. And uh, if you get a microphone in front of you, it's your turn. Uh, we'll start with uh, Nigel Ashford. Thank you. Uh, Nigel Ashford, Institute of Humane Studies. Um, I wonder if anybody on the panel wants to comment on the differences between the continental enlightenment that Professor Coor discusses and the Scottish enlightenment that Professor McNamara discusses. Let me first say something about context there and, and let others address the, <clears throat> the substance. <clears throat> Scottish Enlightenment and the English Enlightenments, and for that matter, the Dutch Enlightenments, occur in a context of relative religious peace, um, indeed, of, of uh, an achieved forbearance uh, <clears throat> that's, that's even enforced by law in, in the Netherlands. The rule of law in England in the 18th century is such that what, what occurs in France with the promulgation of a royal edict, for such is my good pleasure, right? to a Scots or an Englishman would, would sound some barbaric legacy of, of the past. The, the French philosophers are struggling in a world where there is still torture unto death for crimes and for religious crimes, um, a world of total taxation falling upon the poor, exemptions for cities, exemptions for the aristocracy, uh, exemptions for the church. Um, they are dealing with a system of rigid caste uh, that determines even what clothes one may wear. Uh, 
the problems are so urgent in, in France for the philosophers uh, that everything must be a combination of mode of reform, means of, of some reformation uh, of, of a, an evil in their society, uh, as well as a theoretical pronouncement about that. The, the luxury of being able to confront the past um, in moderate Edinburgh with its moderate clergy uh, or in London is such a different world and the struggle so much more immediate and intense in France against despotism, torture, judicial murder, uh, such a different world that way. And still official intolerance of Jews, official intolerance of Protestants, uh, such a different context in which to confront the present and past. Yeah, that, that's very good, I, I, and I, I agree with everything you said. Um, it's, it, it's the case that this, the, the British had kind of solved a bunch of problems that France was trying to solve. Um, uh, and that gives them, uh, uh, sometimes you see in Smith a kind of snootiness, uh, kind of <laughs> looking down at the continent, uh, especially Spain, uh, but uh, 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 France as well. Now, in terms of uh, going back to my talk, um, I don't think that should blind us, though, to the fact that even the, you know, the, the cautious Scots uh, had some big goals uh, in mind. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think their particular contribution was the, 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 the discovery of commerce and its powers, some almost magical powers. I think it was Professor McNamara who sort of posed this question as something that I guess maybe it was Adam Smith asked, but I wrote it down because I thought it was an interesting question in terms of what's happening on campuses today and in society today, so I'm just curious how you guys would answer it, which is the question of can a radical goal be pursued in a moderate way? <laughs> this, <clears throat> uh, th th this is one of the searing questions for the French Enlightenment. Uh, they, they have a fear of passions in a multitude. Um, and <clears throat> The ideal model for the French Enlightenment is one of, of gradual, patient reform in which power is responsive to the wisest, most decent voices uh, <clears throat> in, in a society. And this odd combination of the ability to envision a radically different world, a radically different set, of human, personal, social, political, economic relationships, but a terrible fear that the means of trying to move toward that will unleash passions um, and irrationalities uh, and vulnerabilities to demagoguery uh, that might even outweigh um, a patient, slower approach uh, to crucial to crucial reforms. We all face this on college campuses because we all can see an almost ideal type of world in which people from different backgrounds, different intellectual perspectives, different ideological perspectives um, meet and talk. How do you find the modality of power for reform um, in the institutions we've inherited? I'd be interested in everyone's view of that. Can I say something? Um, so it's a great question, and um, and, I, and I, I don't know the answer to the question except that, uh, as someone who is trying to bring reform within institution, I have to believe that some on some level that's true. Um, my sense of um, faculty on campuses is that there are more people who are sympathetic to the kinds of things that ACTA stands for than you might think. Um, but the dynamic is that uh, I think especially senior tenured faculty have a way of complaining about things. They get up and they say, this is horrible. Why are you doing this? And in many cases, they're exactly right. And then they drop the mic and they walk away. And, and, and so the, the project of actually trying to make reform effective, that's, that's the really hard thing for, for those of us in the university. 
so I don't, I don't have an answer except to say that's exactly the, the thing that I think about every day. Yes, sir. It was curious listening to all of you uh, quote the people who uh, in, had some influence on American political thought. You mentioned Voltaire, uh, Montesquieu, uh, but no one has mentioned Thomas Hobbes. And I think Hobbes had a pronounced influence on American political thought, and I wonder why none of you mentioned him. I think if you read uh, Leviathan, there's a major uh, influence that, that uh, affected those 38 sweaty men who sat in uh, uh, Philadelphia to draft the Constitution. Uh, I'll actually uh, jump in a little bit. I, I uh, have written on Hobbes myself, and uh, I think that's a very interesting question. Hobbes was a very important thinker uh, in the uh, English Renaissance era, the very beginnings of uh, uh, the scientific revolution. And I think that he does uh, have uh, a lot to say uh, about uh, how to approach politics uh, from the point of view of, uh, to use a bit of an anachronism, an engineer. Uh, Hobbes wants to kind of tear apart uh, political life and look at the parts it's made out of and ask, can we put this machine back together uh, in a way that it's not going to fall apart and be smoky and bloody uh, as it has been in the past? And I think that something of that uh, reformer's instinct uh, to look uh, at a reason uh, alone uh, as the standard for reform uh, does um, continue uh, through the Enlightenment. Uh, I will say that one reason I didn't think uh, to include my old friend Hobbes uh, in my remarks today is that he is so illiberal in other ways. He doesn't believe in freedom of religion. Uh, he thinks that the sovereign of the state should be able to determine what we believe. Uh, he uh, doesn't believe in the rule of law because he believes that the, uh, uh, the sovereign, again, the king, should be able to overrule any petty judge who might try to control them. Uh, and so there are so many ways in which uh, the Enlightenment, and especially the uh, Scottish uh, and American Enlightenment, uh, rely on institutions to structure human life and make it better, uh, that uh, where Hobbes wants to rely more on will and uh, personality. I think in some ways. Um, any other? Yeah, I should. Uh, the, the French Enlightenment discovers Hobbes in the second half of the 18th century. Um, the reputation of Hobbes had been reduced to a crude materialist atheist uh, in, in French thought, uh, and in a lot of English thought, as British thought as well. Uh, and, uh, and a French atheist uh, by the name of Baron Dolbach uh, discovers Hobbes, uh, the Tripos, the Tractatus on Human Nature, and translates it into French. Uh, and Diderot, who had been with D'Alembert advancing Locke as the great theorist of human knowledge, uh, Diderot writes, Locke has become a second-rate thinker in my mind now that I've discovered Thomas Hobbes. And it's the mechanistic moral theory, how, how to, to analyze moral behavior and incentives, uh, that the view of human nature that, that so captivates the second half of, of the French uh, Enlightenment with very little attention paid to the political thought. It's, it's Hobbes' is moral thinker and Hobbes' is epistemologist, uh, very little. Uh, response to Hobbes as political thinker. But he, as I say, Diderot says this was the great English thinker of the 17th century. Uh, John Alcorn. Good morning. Uh, I'm John Alcorn. I teach at Trinity College in Connecticut and at the Shelby Cullum Davis Endowment. Uh, another omission, uh, since the emphasis was on the a radical enlightenment, as I heard no mention of Burke and Chesterton's fence. But my, my question lies elsewhere and is for uh, Professor Merrill. You uh, mentioned a critique of the enlightenment. And I'd like your reflections on, a, on a two approaches to moral judgment in history. Circa 1900, Lord Acton wrote a gave a speech in which he said, historians have a duty to judge the past. And that is how students and citizens may find their way today um, ethically in civic affairs. 
50 years later, Herbert Butterfield criticized Acton and said, historians are, must help us understand the past, uh, not, not, not judge the past. So we explain historical events, understand motivations and behaviors. Therein lies the expertise of the historian. And so my, my thought, my intuition as a denizen of the ivory tower is, it's all I can do to be a good husband, a good teacher, a good neighbor, and a good citizen. Who am I to judge Thomas Jefferson? And so there, I, uh, of, of course, what one thing an historian can do is to clarify the values and moral criticisms made at the time and internal contradictions and so on. Anyway, I throw it in. I, I throw it at you. Acton versus Butterfield. Help me find my way. <laughs> uh, so it's a wonderful question, and it, and it's a wonderful question because it's it's a hard question to, to answer. I guess I would say um, I'm not sure that we can try to accur accurately assess what simply what happened without in in some ways inhabiting the moral judgments that the actors themselves as human beings we had were irreducibly normative, we can't help stop making judgments about ourselves. And if we turn a blind eye to that and we simply were to say, I'm simply like a robot looking at the world, that wouldn't work. The, the, danger of, um, the danger is that we start reading the past in terms of ourselves and that it becomes a tool or an instrument by which we, can, we are channeling our own po uh, political passions. And you see this in the classroom all the time. I'm not criticizing students, snowflakes, wokes, whatever, however you want to talk about it. This is, this is what it means to be 18 years old and trying to come to terms with text. So to try to get them to have some distance from that, I think, is your job as a teacher. Um, but of course we have to judge, right? That's, that's somehow what it means to be a human being, especially as a citizen. Where are we as a country? We, we're, I, I have a personal interest in this question, right? I can't, I can't not. So thank you for the question. Uh, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel.